Good evening. It's good to see you once again. Uh, I want to thank you for being here tonight, especially if you were here last night. Um, I'm surprised you came back. No, I'm, uh, I appreciate you being here. It really is a pleasure to be able to uh, speak here, and uh, it's an honor to be able to talk about this topic. It's something that we don't hear a lot about, uh, of course, and a lot of people have a lot of questions. A lot of people have heard a lot of things about the Dead Sea Scrolls, why are they important, and that sort of thing. Uh, I hope that we can address that subject tonight to your satisfaction, and if not, you can always ask questions later, and we'll try to help uh, those areas where maybe we didn't uh, cover so well. Uh, the importance of the Dead Sea Scrolls is several things that we'll discuss, both relating to the Old and the New Testaments, and we'll get to that point in just a moment. I want to spend just a second about the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, because it's a well-known story. Uh, two, uh, or three rather, shepherd boys were walking around in the area of the Dead Sea uh, in a place we now call Qumran, and one of them threw a rock into a cave supposedly looking for a lost sheep, and when he uh, heard the rock uh, hit the cave, it crashed. Sounded like some jars breaking. Well, a couple of days later, another one of those three boys entered into what was eventually called Cave One of the Dead Sea Scrolls and found three scrolls. And those scrolls turned out to be, one of them was a copy of the book of Isaiah. Uh, this is Cave One, what it looks like. One of them was a copy of the book of Isaiah, and the other two were copies of books that nobody had ever seen before, books that were brand new to us. Uh, and they were not copies, of course, of the Bible. Uh, one of the things people sometimes don't realize about the Dead Sea Scrolls is there are about 930 of them that were discovered, and only about, at least at Qumran, and only about 222 of them are copies of the Old Testament. So the overwhelming majority of what we call the Dead Sea Scrolls are not copies of the Bible. And that's something that, again, not a lot of people know. But among the very first scrolls discovered was the Great Isaiah Scroll, as it has been called. Uh, if you go to Jerusalem today, you can visit a museum called the Shrine of the Book. It is a museum dedicated to the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the centerpiece of that museum is a display that kind of looks like the end of a big old scroll. And all the way around that display is the Isaiah Scroll Unrolled. I don't remember exactly how many feet long it is, but it's pretty long. And it's one of the most significant discoveries because it is the only biblical scroll among the Dead Sea Scrolls that preserves an entire book of the Bible. So most of the Dead Sea Scrolls don't look like that. This is what most of the Dead Sea Scrolls look like. It's not a scroll as much as a scrap, right? And people put these together. People who study the Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic, and there were some Nabataean scrolls, those languages, they kind of take tweezers and they put them on pieces of glass and kind of piece them together like pieces of a puzzle. And that's what most of the Dead Sea Scrolls are, just little bitty fragments. In fact, uh, I love this picture for a couple of reasons. One... <laughs> It illustrates what life was like in the 1950s, right? Where you could stand over uh, priceless artifacts worth many millions of dollars with a cigarette hanging out of your mouth and not worry about it. <laughs> Times are different today. <laughs> if, people, if people were doing this kind of work today, they would have archival gloves and maybe even a face mask and a lab coat and they would be all careful, you know. Uh, not so in the 1950s, very different kind of world. But another reason I want to show you this is you can see the kind of work that is being done. Look at those tiny little fragments. 
literally hundreds of these things that someone has picked up and placed in just the right location so that they can help to reconstruct what this original scroll was like when it was actually complete. And most of the Dead Sea Scrolls are like that. In fact, I'll, we'll look at several translations a little bit later on this evening, and you'll see there are all sorts of, uh, of brackets and things to mark where words have to be supplied and filled in uh, because they're missing in the manuscripts just like this. And so the Dead Sea Scrolls more often uh, are better called, I guess, the Dead Sea Scraps. Uh, in a lot of ways, and they have to be pieced together, and there's a very precise science as well as a very good knowledge of these ancient languages that goes into this kind of work. But moving on, uh, we want to spend just a moment on this question, who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls? Who is responsible for this literature? Why does it exist? Well, one of the things that I want to mention is that most of these scrolls were scrolls that were written uh, in their books of, of uh, uh, books that we already knew. So I mentioned about 222 of them are copies of uh, parts of the books of the Bible. Uh, we also have a number of other manuscripts which were copies of books that we've known for years, for centuries. Uh, the Book of Jubilees. We already knew about the Book of Jubilees. Uh, the Book of First Enoch. Lots of manuscripts of both of these books at Qumran. Now, we already knew about them. The Dead Sea Scrolls provide us with earlier and better manuscripts of them. Uh, we also know about, like, the Book of Tobit, some of the books of the Apocrypha and things. These were also discovered at Qumran. So, again, most of the books that were discovered, we already knew about. But there are about a hundred scrolls that we did not know about. Things that we learned about for the very first time. And we call these sectarian. The reason we call them sectarian is because we think that they were uh, composed by members of the Dead Sea Scrolls community themselves. Uh, then we have non-sectarian scrolls, which are not copies of the Bible, but did not originate with the Qumran community. And then finally, the third category is biblical scrolls. But who wrote these things? Well, uh, in short, we don't really know. We don't know who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. In fact, we, we call them Jews, but they don't call themselves that. They never refer to themselves as Jews. In fact, they don't really ever refer to themselves by a name that means anything specific. They, they call themselves the Sons of Light or Children of the Covenant. These obscure names that really don't communicate anything precise about their identity. So because of the ambiguity in who these people call themselves, uh, there's a lot of discussion about who's responsible for these scrolls. If you Google the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Wikipedia article is going to tell you they are most likely associated with a community of Essenes. Last night I talked about the uh, nature of, of Judaism being very fragmented at the time of Jesus, and I said that one of the groups Josephus talks about is the Essenes. Uh, they're not mentioned in the New Testament, but they're uh, quite numerous, according to uh, Philo and Josephus. Philo, I think, says there are about 4,000 Essenes in the first century. Uh, and some people say, well, these are Essenes. The literature doesn't call them that. Uh, and in fact, uh, they do match the Essenes in some very important ways, but they don't match in other ways. So some people have said, well, they represent a subset of the Essenes. Whatever. Uh, we don't know. Some people have said that they are Sadducees because of some of the legal positions that are taken in interpretations of the Law of Moses. Some people, although not very many uh, these days, have said, well, they're Pharisees. Uh, some people have even tried to argue that they were early Christians who wrote the scrolls. Uh, one of the things that you'll find if you read very long on the Internet is that the Dead Sea Scrolls contain copies of parts of the books of the New Testament. That's not true. There is not a single verse from the New Testament found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, there have been people who've tried to argue that, uh, especially in the 1970s, but it's simply not true. Basically, we don't know who these people are. We know that they're Jews. On the whole, they're very conservative. They're very concerned with practicing the faith uh, as set forth in the Old Testament, in particular in the Law of Moses, but we don't really know for sure who these people are. And so that's not a question we can really answer with any absolute certainty. What is important, though, is how this stuff relates to the Bible. What does it tell us about Scripture that we didn't already know? And that's where I'd like for our uh, journey to go next as we think about this subject. First of all, the Dead Sea Scrolls 
were very important early on in helping us better appreciate and understand the text of the Old Testament. Uh, it's kind of bizarre for us to think about this, but before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we had manuscripts of the Greek New Testament that were older than our oldest complete manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible. You understand what I'm saying? The, the books of Moses written in about 1500 B.C., the Old Testament completed uh, over 400 years before Christ, and the oldest, more or less complete manuscripts we had were only about 1,000 years old from where we stand today. So the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls was important because it allowed us to access manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible that took our knowledge a thousand years back further in history than we really had. That was amazing. And there is a lot of significance that comes, of course, with that. What's even more amazing, perhaps, and maybe even shocking to you, is that still, even to this day, most English translations do not take full advantage of the evidence presented by the Dead Sea Scrolls. Why? Only God knows. You might have, if you have a newer translation of the Bible, like the English Standard Version or something, you might get some footnotes that say uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls have this. But they don't really change anything in the text on the basis of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and we'll, we'll talk about some of this in just a second. And so what I always tell people uh, whenever we, we talk about the text of the Old Testament from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I'm going to get kind of technical here for a minute, so uh, forgive me or be drawn in more, whichever you're inclined to do, uh, but sometimes people will say the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls basically confirms everything we know about the Old Testament text. That's not exactly true. It does, on the whole, I think, confirm our faith in the reliability of the preservation of the Old Testament text. So let me say that at first, and I'll explain what I mean more by that in just a moment. But it also complicates certain things. For example, there are some times where the Dead Sea Scrolls help us confirm what the Greek Old Testament already had. Now, what that means is we're not learning something that we didn't already know, but we're getting new evidence for something we already knew. Let me give you a couple of examples. In the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 17, in verse number 4, you read about David, he's going out to fight Goliath in this chapter, and verse 4 tells you how tall Goliath is. And the uh, Masoretic Hebrew text, from which most of our English translations come, okay, it says Goliath is six cubits and a span. Now, a cubit is the length from the tip of your middle finger to your elbow. It's about 18 to 21 inches, give or take. And a span is the width of a, of a man's hand, so about four inches or so. And you calculate that out, and the Masoretic Hebrew text is telling you that Goliath is about nine and a half feet tall. That's really tall. The Greek Old Testament for centuries has had a different reading. And now we know, thanks to the Dead Sea Scrolls, that the very oldest copy of Samuel that we have says exactly the same thing that the Greek Old Testament has always said, that Goliath was not six cubits in a span, but four cubits in a span or somewhere in the neighborhood of six and a half feet tall. Now, the average Israelite at the time of the Old Testament was probably about five feet seven, so six and a half feet tall is still going to be looking like a giant. See, this is your close societies where everybody's basically the same height, and so six and a half feet tall is still really tall, but it changes the height of Goliath a little bit based on our oldest manuscripts of Samuel. Now, that probably shouldn't bother us because every picture of Goliath my children have ever covered, uh, colored in Bible class, Goliath's like 28 feet tall anyway, right? In every vacation Bible school sit, skit that you do, he's at least 15 feet tall, right? So uh, we sort of exaggerate the height of Goliath even beyond uh, what the Masoretic Hebrew has it. And uh, I guess at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter how tall Goliath is, but this is something that's a little different. And if we pay attention to our very oldest manuscript in Hebrew, we have to seriously consider that information. Another example is found in Psalm 145. Now, if you look in Psalm 145, some of your Bibles will tell you, uh, other, others of you won't have Bibles that tell you this, but some of your Bibles will tell you this is an acrostic poem. 
Uh, one of the things about Hebrew poetry that makes it so complex is sometimes they arrange poems according to the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. We call these acrostics. The most famous one is Psalm 119. Now you know Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible, but it's actually one continuous poem and every four lines starts with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Now if I asked you to write a poem like that tonight, we'd probably be here by midnight and you'd, you'd struggle to come up with a coherent poem that went through the letters of the alphabet like that. But this is the way that some of the chapters of the Bible are written. Well, that's Psalm 145. The problem is, in the Masoretic Hebrew text, and therefore in all of our English translations, if you're using a mainstream English translation, you are missing a verse. There's no question. This is not like liberal scholars telling you you're missing a verse. You are missing a verse because the letter noon is missing. One of the Hebrew letters is just not there. Now, that verse is in the Greek Old Testament. We've known about it for years, but it's not in the Hebrew manuscripts uh, from which our English Bibles are usually translated. But you look at one of the Psalms manuscripts that covers Psalm 145 from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and lo and behold, you have the verse. The same verse we already knew from the Greek Old Testament is in the uh, Hebrew manuscript from Qumran. And it says, God is faithful in his words and gracious in his works. 11Q Psalms says that. God is faithful in his words and gracious in all his works. Now, there are a couple things I want to say before we move on. Did you learn anything there? How many of you did not know before I just read those words that God was not faithful and gracious? The Bible affirms that in a number of places, which is kind of an interesting point, that even though we find some things that tweak uh, certain texts or maybe make us think seriously about certain other texts, none of these variant readings that the Dead Sea Scrolls helped us uncover, none of them change anything that we didn't already know. None of them ch challenge our view of God. None of them change anything in Israelite history. None of them force us to look differently at the people of Israel and the covenant that God established with them. Everything's basically the same that we've always believed. Now, it's hard to explain that without thinking about the providence of God. Can you see it? How God sort of worked behind the scenes to make sure that everything that people had to know, they knew. Another example. This is an example of something that actually is not found in the Greek Old Testament or in any other place that we know. It's a new passage. But it's an interesting one. If you have your English Bibles, go to 1 Samuel chapter 11, and we'll read a, a part of this passage together. And then I want to read a part of the passage preserved in the oldest Hebrew copy of the book of 1 Samuel we have. And you'll see how much more valuable that passage from the Dead Sea Scrolls is. It doesn't really change anything, the Bible says, but it adds to our knowledge of why it says what it says. All right, so I'm in, I'm in 1 Samuel 1, and I'm reading, or excuse me, 11, and I'm reading in verse 1. 1 Samuel 11, reading, beginning in verse 1. Then Nachash the Ammonite, this foreign king, went up and besieged Jabesh Gilead. That's the way you say that. So all the people of Jabesh said to Nachash, Make a covenant with us, and we will serve you. But Nachash the Ammonite said to them, I will make it with you, I'll make a covenant with you on this condition, that I gouge out the right eye of every one of you and so disgrace all Israel. Now, if you are reading this passage, and many of you no doubt have read it before, you are wondering, what in the world is this guy on? You know, well, yeah, I'll make a covenant with you as long as I can poke out your right eyes. Ha, ha, ha. Why does he say this? It sort of comes out of nowhere and the Bible just leaves it hanging. It's not explained. But if you follow the text of the very oldest Hebrew copy of Samuel, you get these words. You won't find these in your English translations, most of you, unless you're using the New Revised Standard Version. It's in there. Nachash, king of the Ammonites, oppressed the Gadites and the Reubenites. You know, those two tribes that settled to the uh, east of the Jordan. He oppressed the Gadites and the Reubenites viciously. 
He put out the right eye of all of them and brought fear and trembling on Israel. Not one of the Israelites in the region beyond the Jordan remained, whose right eye Nachash king of the Ammonites did not put out, except 7,000 men who escaped from the Ammonites and went to Jabesh Gilead. Well, you read those words and all of a sudden what you just read in your English translations makes much much more sense. He has just attacked these two tribes to the east of the Jordan, and in the process of attacking and subduing them, he gouged out their right eyes, and then the 7,000 who managed to escape his wrath fled to territory on the other side of the Jordan where their brethren were, and he said, sure, I'll make a covenant as long as you let me do what I did to your compatriots a month earlier. Well, it makes much more sense. And so these are the kinds of things that the Dead Sea Scrolls sometimes helps us with. Now, let me say this. Uh, some of you might be thinking, uh, and you're getting kind of worried, about, well, wait a minute. If you find three or four passages that, that kind of change things, then, then what does that say about the rest of the Bible? Can we trust the Bible? Can we know that what we're reading is actually the Word of God? And Let's calm down. Serenity now. Right? Take, a deep, take a deep breath. Almost every passage in the Bible is confirmed in almost every single word by the extant Dead Sea Scrolls that cover them. The reason I'm talking about these is because they're the most outstanding. They are by far and away exceptions, not the rule. So in the overwhelming majority of cases, with the overwhelming number of manuscripts, the Dead Sea Scrolls confirms what we already knew. And that's why people say, oh, the Dead Sea Scrolls confirm our knowledge of the Old Testament. That's not wrong. It just needs to be qualified a little bit. Because I have students, you see, who've been told that. And then they come uh, to Fried Hardeman, and then one of their friends who's uh, armed with Google, which is very dangerous sometimes, uh, he types in Dead Sea Scrolls, reliability of the Old Testament, and he finds that there are passages like this. And he says, well, what do we do? We have these passages that change the Bible, and, and we don't know how tall Goliath is. Like, it really matters, but it's okay. And they get really worked up, and then they come talk to me, and I said, look, you're looking at one or two exceptions. Let's look at the totality of things, and let's compare. Well, when you do that, there's no question. I don't want to put a percentage on it because I couldn't possibly be accurate, but you'll hear people say 90, 95, 98, 99 percent of what we knew about the Old Testament is identical. Whatever the case is, it's a high percentage, and I'll just leave it there. And so if you have more questions about that, feel free to ask, but for the most part, the Dead Sea Scrolls allowed us to have even more confidence in the text of our Old Testaments, and not less. Secondly, the Dead Sea Scrolls shed light on which books were considered authoritative by Jews living uh, around the time of the New Testament. Uh, the canon of the Old Testament is a discussion that people have had for many years. Uh, in fact, a gentleman brought me a, a book from his library. Uh, I've seen the same book. My father has it in his library as well, The Lost Books of the Bible. And you'll, you'll turn onto the National Geographic channel or the History channel and you see these programs and it's always some guy with this ominous voice. Do we have the Bible? And then you're supposed to say, no, we don't, and what do we do? And okay, let's not panic, all right? Uh, we, we do have the Bible. And uh, what we see from the Dead Sea Scrolls, at least we get some evidence that they're basically reading the same books that the early Christians are reading. And that's an important uh, thing for us to uh, recognize and appreciate. But I do wanna say this. Sometimes people are guilty, again, of oversimplification. Uh, I've never been accused of oversimplifying anything, uh, so I'll try not to do that tonight. But one of the things that people will say is, we found a copy of every single book of the Old Testament among the Dead Sea Scrolls, with the exception of Esther. Somebody said it. Somebody whispered it. It's right. Say it loud. Esther. And so they say, well, apparently then Esther was not part of the biblical canon of the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's not necessarily true. In fact, there are two things. Number one, First and Second Chronicles is a lot of Bible, isn't it? Now you look at the Old Testament and pinch First and Second Chronicles, it's a pretty significant amount. We have one manuscript from the Dead Sea Scrolls of all of First and Second Chronicles, and it's about the size of my hand. 
Now let's say that that manuscript fragment kind of floated down and landed on the floor of one of those caves, and one of those early uh, raiders of those caves walked in and went, oh, what did you say, Jimmy? And turned his foot, and then the thing goes, and spores go everywhere, and we don't have a copy of First and Second Chronicles anymore. Now that's obviously hypothetical and ridiculous, but what I'm saying is, of all of 1st and 2nd Chronicles, we have one manuscript and it's barely anything. So who's to say that maybe something similar didn't happen to Esther? It was there. Maybe it wasn't that popular. By the way, I'll remind you, the New Testament never quotes 1st and 2nd Chronicles or the book of Esther either, which is interesting. But w what do we say about that? Well, absence of evidence is not necessarily evidence of absence. You understand what I'm saying? Just because we don't have a manuscript, we can't assume they didn't have the book. The second thing that enters into this is there are multiple copies of books that we do not include in the Old Testament canon. No Christian tradition includes in the Old Testament canon, or at least most don't. Jubilees and First Enoch, there are a lot of copies. 26, 27, 28 copies of these books combined that are found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Does that mean that these books were considered part of the Bible by the community of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Not necessarily. If you have a lot of books at your home, my assumption is if I walked in and I were to count the titles of your books, you would own more copies of non-biblical books than you would copies of the Bible. Am I wrong? You might have an encyclopedia set. If you're like us, You've got a whole shelf full of children's books that people have very kindly given you through the years. You have all kinds of books. Maybe you have a shelf, half a shelf of Bibles. But if I ask you, which one of these books are you reading the most? I hope you would say the Bible. These Bibles may not outnumber other books that you own, but they're used far more often. And so who's to say, based on count alone, how the books that are in the library of the Dead Sea Scrolls were actually used? See, that's a question that we can't answer nearly as easily. What we have to do is actually look at the other works that these people are writing and see which scriptures they're quoting, see which scriptures they're referencing. And when we do that, we find that they're using the same scriptures the New Testament authors do. They're using the Psalms, they're using Isaiah, they're using the books of Moses. They are using all of these authoritative scriptures that we would already recognize. And so it helps us understand that the books they regarded as authoritative are the very same books that Paul and Peter and all the rest regard as authoritative. And so the presence or absence of a book does not necessarily mean anything about its canonicity at Qumran. Uh, this is a, 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 it's a, a chart that I borrowed from a book on the Dead Sea Scrolls. And you can see how it kind of shakes out. I know I'm comparing apples to oranges in a way here. But the quotations, the number of quotations in the New Testament uh, versus the number of manuscripts from Qumran, and what you can see is, on the whole, they're kind of the same. The book of Psalms is the most often quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament. Guess what? There are more manuscripts of the book of Psalms than any other book of the Old Testament at Qumran. Deuteronomy, same kind of deal. Genesis, Isaiah, very popular in the New Testament, also very popular at Qumran. Used far more than the manuscript number would actually indicate. So you can see the point. The point is that even though the Dead Sea Scrolls don't represent what all Jews are thinking, we talked last night about characterizing all Jews in the same way, but it at least illustrates for us that the biblical books that are popular, those are the books that are also popular among the authors and the audiences of the New Testament. Now, let me ask you a, a probing question. If I were to take last year's sermons and take the texts that were referred to from this very pulpit, would I reach a conclusion that you excluded certain books from your canon? How many references to the Song of Songs did we have last year? Or to Chronicles? Or to Zechariah? Or to the last six chapters of Daniel? First six chapters, that's VBS stuff. The last six chapters, it's uh, very different. You see, you see my point. And so it would be unfair to judge what you thought about the canon on the basis of how frequently you quoted or used books. I think if we expect that standard to be applied to us, 
the ancients at least deserve the same courtesy. So we need to be careful about overgeneralization on that front. But I want to switch gears now and talk about the New Testament. So get your Bibles out because we're going to turn to some passages and take a look at some things. The Dead Sea Scrolls illustrate a lot of things that help us better appreciate and understand the New Testament. Even though not, not a single passage that we know of from the Dead Sea Scrolls is quoted in the New Testament, not a single passage in the New Testament is found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, they are in many respects mutually enlightening. For example, they illustrate the fact that the Jews didn't all believe the same thing. I know I covered this territory than, uh, last night, so I'll move a little bit more quickly here. But we talked about how there were all sorts of Jews at the time of Jesus who believed all sorts of things, not unlike modern denominational Christianity, where there are all sorts of different Christian groups all teaching very different things. The Qumran community has a major problem with Judaism as it is being represented in Jerusalem among the priests. They refer in their literature to a gentleman known as the wicked priest, the man of the lie, the spouter of lies, the dripper of lies, why didn't, why didn't they just tell his name? Why didn't they just say, you know, the priest, Bill, or John? Why, don't, why did they use these titles? I don't know. Maybe they wanted to conceal their identity. But they have major beef with the Jerusalem priesthood at the time. Okay? So these people have a problem with Judaism in its most public form. Another thing that we learn from the Dead Sea Scrolls is, and we'll see this from a text in just a moment, but these people actually believe that they are the temple of God, the community. The temple of God is not a building made out of stone perched upon a mountain on the eastern end of Jerusalem. The temple of God is the community of the faithful. And that is a thought that cannot be underestimated for understanding the New Testament, as we'll see in just a moment. So what we find from the Dead Sea Scrolls is not all Jews are the same. They believe and teach all sorts of different things, and that's a very important thing to know. But also we find certain specific things. What did Jews expect at the time of the Messiah? Now you probably, because you're good students of the Gospels, you could put together lots of things. Well, they expected a military leader. They expected a, an earthly king and an earthly kingdom. And you would be right about all that. But the Dead Sea Scrolls help us, they're among the number of, pa of books and passages that help us, understand what Jews at the time of Jesus might have been looking for in a Messiah. One of the things is they use this passage, Isaiah 40 and verse 3. A voice crying in the wilderness, they're in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Now you know this verse as being on the lips of what biblical character? John the baptizer, right. In fact, the Gospel of Mark opens up in precisely that way, referring to the career of John the baptizer. He is the voice crying in the wilderness. The Qumran community placed themselves as the voice crying in the wilderness. But notice in addition to that, Luke 7, verses 20 through 22. And I'll read this uh, other passage on the screen in just a moment. But Luke chapter 7, verses 20 uh, through, well, really 21 and 22. John the baptizer sends messengers to Jesus because he's noticing that Jesus is getting a lot of attention for these healings and all these things. And he wants to know, is this really the Messiah? Is this the guy I'm supposed to be preparing the way for? And these messengers come to Jesus, and they said in verse 20 of Luke 7, John the baptizer has sent us to you saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? In that hour he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirit, and on many who were blind he bestowed sight. And Jesus answered these messengers, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight. The lame, the crippled, the handicapped walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. The poor have good news preached to them. Now, this is a passage that Luke is unique in recording for us. But notice the passage from the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is known, it's not really a good name for it, but the Messianic Apocalypse. Notice what is said in that very fragmentary text. For the heavens and the earth shall obey his Messiah, and all in them shall not turn from the commandments of the holy ones. Strengthen yourselves, you who seek the Lord in his service, for the Lord seeks the pious and calls the righteous by name. His spirit, God's sending his spirit, you see, 
two people, hovers over the humble, and he refreshes the faithful with his strength. For he shall honor the pious on the throne of an eternal kingdom, Daniel 2.44, freeing prisoners, giving sight to the blind, straightening the crooked, and the Lord will perform miracles, glorious deeds, things that have never happened, just as he said, for he shall heal those who are crippled, handicapped, and he shall bring the dead to life. He shall proclaim good news to the poor. Many of the very same elements Jesus says, go to John the baptizer and report what you're seeing. These are things that at least some Jewish groups expected the Messiah to do. Now this is even more poignant if you buy into the idea that John the baptizer actually belonged to the Dead Sea community himself. Whether he did or not, impossible really to know. But these are the kinds of passages that help us to kind of understand. People were looking for the very kind of person Jesus proved to be. Now, of course, Jesus sometimes doesn't match people's expectations. He opposes them. But here is a case where he matches. Another example is in Matthew chapter 18. I won't take the time to read this, although you're welcome to turn there and, and read it uh, if you'd like. Uh, this is a familiar passage to you, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, because this is uh, where you learn how to handle a brother or sister, I guess, with whom you have a problem, right? And so if you've got a problem with somebody, what do you do? You go to them and you try to sort it out. Now, you make sure you're calm and cool when you do that because you don't want to escalate the problem, but you go and talk to them. And if that person won't listen to you when you go talk to them, what do you do? You take two or three with you and, and you all go talk to them. And if that doesn't work, then you bring it before the congregation and let everybody decide. Isn't that pretty much what we're used to hearing? Well, isn't it interesting that there are a couple of passages from the Dead Sea Scrolls that outline a very similar procedure, but there's something added. In Leviticus chapter 19, in verse 17, you have this command that you shall reprove your neighbor. Now, you know what Leviticus 19 and verse 18 says, right? Jesus tells us that's the second greatest commandment. You shall love your neighbor neighbor as yourself. What we know is that this passage was very important, and Jews at the time were discussing what this passage meant. What does it mean to reprove someone? How do you get along with your brother in uh, the faith? And notice what this text says. For a man to reprove his neighbor in truth, humility, and loyal love for the man. That's what motivates restoring broken relationships. Let no one speak to his brother in anger or grumbling or with a stiff neck or jealous evil spirit, and let him not hate in the foreskin of his heart, but rather that day when you've got a grievance with someone, reprove him so as not to bear sin because of him. And also let no one bring a charge against his neighbor in front of the multitude, which has not first been brought in reproof before witnesses. You see what Jesus tells us in Matthew 18? It's exactly the same thing that is said here. You go to them one-on-one, -on -one, make sure you're calm first, be humble, be kind, be nice, but go to them first, and then make sure you take witnesses with you, but if, if none of that works, the congregation needs to get involved, the multitude needs to get involved. Now, Jesus is not copying this procedure from the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's something that was common within Judaism, and Jesus is simply repeating this common wisdom. In fact, I'm not the first preacher to remark, based on Matthew 18, that's sort of common sense if you want to solve conflict, right? And so this is another passage that helps us shed light on something said in the New Testament. Another passage, uh, and uh, we'll look at a couple of concepts in, in just a moment, and then we'll uh, be done. But in 2 Corinthians 6, verses uh, 14 through 16, I'm going to save the last one here for just a second, but in 2 Corinthians 6, the Bible says, again, in a very mysterious passage, you're familiar with it, I tried to pick out passages that I thought we would all know, and this is one that I, I hope all of us know. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness, what accord has Christ with Belial? This is one of the few times in the New Testament where we read about Satan by the name of Belial. Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Now, I'll just stop right there. Notice the resonances 
between what Paul says here and what we often find in the Dead Sea Scrolls. One is the opposition of light and darkness. Now, we know this from the Gospel of John, from 1 John, light, good, darkness, bad. And often these are used as metaphors to describe righteous and wicked people. Paul uses that here. It's used consistently in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Also, the name Belial for Satan. Uh, that name doesn't occur in the Old Testament in reference to Satan. In fact, uh, the idea that there is a power named Satan that opposes the wicked is very rare in the Old Testament. I'm not sure how many of us reading the Old Testament realize that. Basically, you got kind of the first two chapters of Job, and that's about it. you got a passage of Zechariah as well, but there's not a lot. Whereas in the, you get to the New Testament, it's much more common. Where do you think that came from? It came from the intertestamental period, and this is just one of the passages that illustrates that, even down to the very term that's used. But then the last thing, and the most important thing I want to point out in this passage, is the fact that Paul says, don't defile the temple of God because we are the temple of God. The temple of God is not a building that some king built. It's not a building where priests serve and offer sacrifices. It is the righteous people of the Lord. That's who the temple is. And you have this passage from the community rule of Qumran. At that time, the men of the community shall separate a house, talking about people, by the way, uh, of holiness for Aaron, a, a holy of holies for the community, and a house out of the community of Israel, those walking in perfection. Now, more of this passage, which I, I didn't want to put on the screen, it makes clear that we're talking about the people. They're the temple. They're the holy community. Where does the New Testament get that concept? Everywhere in the Old Testament, the temple is a building. In the New Testament, the temple is people. Where did the change occur? In the intertestamental period. There are some controversial issues of New Testament significance that may or may not be helped by the Dead Sea Scrolls. I don't know if you're familiar with this debate or not. It's kind of a geeky debate if you want to know my opinion. But since I'm a geek, I'm interested in it. But... Um, the idea in John 3.16, God so loved the world that he sent his what? Depends on what version of the Bible you're reading, doesn't it? The King James, and in fact most of the mainstream translations of the English Bible, the American Standard, New American Standard, they read only begotten son. But you may be aware of the fact that there's a big discussion about what this word means. Uh, whether it means only begotten or whether it means one of a kind. And really the argument that is made is based on Hebrews chapter 11, where Isaac is referred to as the uh, same word that is used, monogenes, son of Abraham. And people say, well, Abraham already had one son named Ishmael, so Isaac could not have been the only begotten, and therefore they conclude that Jesus wasn't maybe the only begotten son of God. Well, if you want to know the truth, just looking at the Greek word, both definitions are actually accurate. They're both represented in literature, so you could go either way. The question is not what, what the word can mean, what the word does mean in this context. It may be that one of the Dead Sea Scrolls kind of helps here. Notice in one of the, uh, one of the copies of uh, the document we just referred to earlier, the rule of the community, community rule, it says, and this translation sometimes gets disputed because people don't like the wording of it, but at a session of the men of renown, those summoned to the gathering of the community council, when God begets. The Hebrew word could be translated, when God fathers the Messiah. This could be taken as evidence that in Judaism, prior to the time of Jesus, people had the idea that God would beget the Messiah, and therefore it lends support to the traditional reading, only begotten. I don't want to push that because somebody will want to fight me about it somewhere. But uh, anyway, that's at least something I think is worth considering. One final passage, which I think is very, very uh, interesting and important. Um, if somebody knows everything that the New Testament is talking about in Hebrews 7 when it describes Melchizedek, see me after class. Uh, I would love for you to expound upon that for me. That's a complicated passage, Hebrews chapter 7. Uh, it describes how Melchizedek is like the Son of God. By the way, I didn't misspeak. Most people misread Hebrews 7. It doesn't say Jesus is like Melchizedek. If you read it carefully, it says Melchizedek is like Jesus. Jesus was first, 
Jesus was greater from the beginning. And so Jesus is not Melchizedek. Melchizedek was like Jesus. A lot of people go astray there, but that's a tangent. What I want to do here is to talk about why it is that Melchizedek shows up in Hebrews 7 at all. In Genesis 14, you've got a couple, three verses about Melchizedek. In Psalm 110, you've got sort of a random mention of Melchizedek. He doesn't occur anywhere else in the Old Testament. You can read the entire New Testament. Melchizedek doesn't show up anywhere, but he's all over Hebrews 7. Why? Why are people interested in Melchizedek? Well, guess what? The Dead Sea Scrolls have quite a lot of interest in this guy, Melchizedek. There's a, a document, very fragmentary, uh, which is found in Cave 11 from Qumran, 11Q Melchizedek. And notice a couple of readings from that. And these are the inheritance of Melchizedek, who shall return them and shall proclaim liberty to them. What's Melchizedek going to do? He's going to set the people of God free. He's going to leave behind for them the burden of all their iniquities. What's the great priest Melchizedek going to do? He's going to set people free from their sins. What does Jesus do in the book of Hebrews? He is the perfect sacrifice to set you and I free from our sins. A few lines later, And Melchizedek shall bring the vengeance of God's judgments, and on that day he shall free them, the people of God, from the hand of Belial and from the hand of all the spirits of his lot. What's he going to do? He's going to set them free from the power of evil, from the power of death. Now I realize that the book of Hebrews doesn't say anything that, that really resembles these exact words, but the ideas are there. Hebrews is writing to a group of people who have certain expectations, certain questions. Who is this Melchizedek and what's he all about? And they've got literature, perhaps, that tells them this Melchizedek is a messianic type of figure who's going to execute God's judgments and save God's people from their sins. And the author of Hebrews says, you know, all that stuff you've heard about Melchizedek, all those traditions and all that speculation, let me tell you who that really is. Let me tell you who filled that role. It's Jesus of Nazareth. So don't go to Judaism. Don't find, don't find strength within that faith. Stay in Christianity and know that you've already found the Melchizedek who matters. Okay, conclusions. The Dead Sea Scrolls, as we said, sometimes do complicate our knowledge of the text of the Old Testament. But on the whole, it actually helps us to appreciate far more what we already knew allowing us to take back the documentable evidence for what we already knew a thousand plus years uh, older than we could before. By the way, the earliest copies of the Bible from the Dead Sea Scrolls date to the third century BC. The second thing, the Dead Sea Scrolls helps us to understand what questions people had, what, what debates people were having at the time in some of the language that was used to describe those debates. It sheds light on the New Testament from that point of view. But then thirdly, the Dead Sea Scrolls, I think, are a challenge for us to continue our search for knowledge and wisdom, to continue to dig, pun intended, uh, into the Word of God, to learn all that we can about our faith and to uncover as much as we can about what the will of God is, even for us as we seek to live a life pleasing to Him. And so as we think about all of the material we've covered so far in these first two sessions, think about the way in which all of these people were giving their lives to investigate the Bible and think so hard about some of these challenging questions. And then ask, have I invested that much in myself and in my faith? And if the answer is, no, I haven't, then why not? Why haven't you gone deeper? Why haven't you gone further? It may be that you're subject to the Lord's invitation tonight, that you need to turn away from sin in your life and start a new path. Dig deeper within God's Word and find strength in His power and grace. Could we invite you to do that this evening? Maybe you've never been immersed in water for the remission of sins. Could we encourage you? Make that decision before you leave. Repent of your sins and confess the sweet name before all of us all and be immersed to begin your walk with Him. If we can help you in any way, we invite you to come forward now as we stand and sing this song.